Hi, I'm Randall Van Meglen. I'm continuing my discussion of selected songs for worship, which this Sunday will be April 19th. We have included selections spanning the 18th century, as well as one contemporary song. The prelude will be Yesu Joy of Man's Desiring. This chorale was composed by Johann Schaff and was harmonized for a more extended form called a cantata by Johann Sebastian Bach. Chorales are basically Lutheran hymns. These were popularized by Martin Luther, who insisted that chorales be included in all services. Rather than relying on the mediation of an earthly priest, Luther embraced the biblical doctrine of the priesthood of all believers, which holds that every believer has direct access to God through the mediation of our great high priest, Christ Jesus. Luther therefore required that chorales be understandable, that they be sung in the vernacular, the language of the people, by the entire congregation. Many chorales have become an important part of our worship corpus as well, including A Mighty Fortress is Our God, All My Heart This Night Rejoices, and O Sacred Head Now Wounded. About 200 years after Luther, the devout Lutheran Johann Sebastian Bach composed both liturgical and secular music to the glory of God. Before notating his music, he typically marked his manuscripts with the acronym JJ, Jesu Yuga, Help Me Jesus, or INJ, in Nomine Jesu, in the name of Jesus. And he usually completed his manuscripts with SDG, Soli Deo Gloria, To God Alone Be the Glory. Our first hymn will be I Sing the Mighty Power of God, written by the father of English hymnody, the nonconformist minister Isaac Watts. Watts wrote over 750 hymns, including When I Survey the Wondrous Cross and Joy to the World. An interesting fact about him is that he was well known in academic circles outside the church as well as the author of the authoritative text on logic, which became the standard text on logic at Oxford and the Ivy League schools as well. Like Luther, Watts believed that it is essential that God's people understand what they are singing. In the preface to his children's hymnal, where this hymn was included, he wrote, quote, Children of high and low degree, of the Church of England or dissenters, baptized in infancy or not, may all join together in these songs, as I have endeavored to sink the language to the level of a child's understanding, and yet to keep it, if possible, above contempt. So I have designed to profit all, if possible, and offend none. Watts titled this children's hymn, Praise for Creation and Providence. The hymn praises our Creator for His power, wisdom, and goodness gloriously displayed in the created order, and wonderfully manifested in His everywhere pre present of providential care. This hymn is profitable and comforting for us as well, young and old today, particularly as we endure the coronavirus pandemic, to be reminded that all creation makes God's glories known, and all events are ordered by our good and wise God, who alone gives life and ever cares for his works. Our next song is Isaiah 43, a contemporary setting to verses 2 and 3. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. This fits in so well with this Sunday's passage, a portion of Deuteronomy, where God recounts how he demonstrated his might in delivering Israel from Egypt, how he spoke to them and drove out the nations from their presence and gave them land as their inheritance and promised to extend his covenant blessings to his people and their children and call them to covenant fidelity so that they would know that he alone is God. We will respond to the sermon with amazing grace. The author John Newton was born into a Christian home, at least in his earlier years. Uh, he lived through it uh, through a godly mother who died when he was only seven. But during that time, before her death, she filled his mind with scripture. At the age of 11, 
He joined his father in a very difficult and rough life as a sailor, and he underwent many trials, and he later was promoted to slave ship captain. Several factors contributed to Newton's conversion, including the seeds of the word planted by his faithful mother, the witnessing of his friend Mary Catlett, whom he later married, a near drowning, and his reading of Thomas Akempis' Imitation of Christ. Newton eventually gave up the slave trade and became associated with William Wilberforce in efforts to abolish slavery. Newton also came under the influence of George Whitfield and John and Charles Wesley, and later was ordained a minister in the Church of England. After many faithful years of ministry, when he became blind and was encouraged to retire from preaching, he responded, What? Shall the old African blasphemer stop while he still can speak? Amazing Grace is Newton's spiritual autobiography, and really it's ours as well. At the end of his life, Newton said, There are two things I'll never forget, that I was a great sinner and that Jesus Christ is a greater Savior. May the Lord richly bless you and your family as you gather in his holy presence to worship him.